here, and the fight continues. The Prime Minister said thank you to the salt workers who were out on strike for 192 days, the auto workers who bargained the largest contract in history, the transit workers who defended their right of 10 days paid sick leave, the workers at Jameson and Greenshield fighting for better, a historic day at the Union Hall, Madam Speaker, a new partnership with Labour, and the best is yet to come. The Honourable Member for Port Moody, Coquitlam. Madam Speaker, Canadians want greedy CEOs and mega corporations to stop profiteering off the backs of unpaid work. Yet the federal government continues to ignore this issue. Over 17,000 Canadians called on the federal government to close loopholes that allow airlines to force flight attendants to work up to 35 hours per month unpaid. And 6 million people watched as the CEO of Canada's largest airline refused to comment. Workers are being exploited by billion-dollar companies, and this government is letting it happen. At Air Canada, the CEO earned over $12 million last year, while their flight attendants struggled to pay rent and buy groceries. Thanks to CUPE components across this country, workers are fighting back with a campaign called Unpaid Work Won't Fly. The NDP stands with these flight attendants and is calling on this government to protect all workers and stop the exploitation by greedy CEOs. The Honourable Member for Drummond. Madam Speaker, we hear a lot about the importance of protecting and promoting Quebec songwriting, but it takes a lot more than words. It also takes music, of course, but also we need people who ensure to take action to protect songwriting, like Véronique Cloutier and the whole team at Rouge FM who decided that their hit show, Véronique and the Fantastique, will now become 100% francophone, only French music during this premier drive-home show. It's a, real, it's a really strong signal sent to the public and the competition. So I'd like to thank Véronique Cloutier. Thank you for standing up for Quebec songwriting. Thank you for supporting our creators and sending a clear message that at this time, a very difficult time for the music industry, Quebec stands with you. Thank you for proving that we can create hit shows with very diverse programming, thanks to all of our talent. Thank you, Véronique et les Fantastiques. The Honourable Member for Portage, Lister. Madam Speaker, do you know the most common question I get in any community that I represent? It's not, what are you going to do about this policy or that policy? It's, when can we have an election? Yeah. It's because after eight years, Canadians know that this Prime Minister is simply not worth the cost. But last night, the Liberal NDP Bloc Coalition instead abandoned their constituents and decided to prop up this historically unpopular Liberal Prime Minister in the twilight of his disastrous career. From groceries to gas to home heating and everything in between, it has all become unaffordable. So what is the solution in the minds of this costly coalition? It's to ram through a 23% carbon tax hike on April 1st. How out of touch can you be? Nobody I've talked to has said, you know what maybe the solution is? Sending more money to Ottawa. It's time for a carbon tax election, so we can let Canadians decide if they can afford another carbon tax hike. Common sense Conservatives will axe the tax for everyone, on everything, and for good. Honourable Member for Mississauga, Aaron Mills. Madam Speaker, Canada Summer Jobs is back, and we are ready to help young people gain the skills and work experience they need to succeed. Last year, through the Canada Summer Jobs, our Liberal government invested over $285 million in organizations across the country who created over 74,000 youth jobs. I can tell you firsthand the impact that this program is having in my riding of Mississauga, Erin Mills, where last year we invested in 57 local organizations and small businesses to create nearly 400 jobs for youth. I want to recognize a few of these awesome organizations who received funding last year in my riding, including the Boys and Girls Club of Peel, Ivan Franco Holmes, the Mississauga Dolphins Cricket Association, and Music for Every Child, who do so much great work in the community. Thank you to all the recipient organizations and all of those who continue to invest in our youth for our future. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Questions and uh, questions, questions oral oral questions. The honorable hey. member, the, the honorable government uh, official opposition whip. 
In an act of political cowardice, the NDP and Liberals ignored 70 per cent of Canadians and 7 out of 10 premiers last night, showing Canadians they don't care. They've abandoned the people they were elected to serve by voting to increase the carbon tax by 23 per cent on April 1st. They're forcing families to pay higher prices for gas, groceries and home heating. This at a time when food banks are shattering records. After eight years, the Prime Minister isn't worth the cost. If the carbon tax is so popular, why won't he call a carbon tax election so Canadians can decide for themselves? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Environment and Climate Change and the Minister of Sports and Physical Activity. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Canada carbon rebate is possible because we put a price on pollution, and that's what's driving down uh, the, uh, the, the emissions in Canada, Madam Speaker. Carbon pricing is working in Canada. It is driving down our emissions, and we're doing that while sending more money back to 8 out of 10 Canadian families with the Canada carbon rebate, Madam Speaker. But the Conservatives want to ruin the rebate. They don't want any money to go back to Canadian families. It's very clear who they work for. It's not Canadians. It's big oil and gas. Conservative hypocrisy at its finest, Madam Speaker. Honourable Official Opposition Whip. Well, this government is flailing, and their climate record is failing. In BC, the federally mandated carbon tax will raise $9 billion over three years and credit back only $3.5 billion. I know that NDP Liberal math is hard to understand, but that is a $5.5 billion net cost to British Columbians. 70% of Canadians and 7 out of 10 premiers agree. When will the Prime Minister finally admit his carbon tax is just like him, not worth the cost, and let Canadians vote to axe the tax? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I find it shameful that the Conservatives continue to use the affordability crisis and Canadians who are experiencing difficulty financially at home as a wedge against climate policy, Madam Speaker. There simply is not one economist in Canada who has claimed or suggested that pricing carbon is what's driving inflation. In fact, Madam Speaker, over the last couple of years, as the price of pollution has gone up, so have the rebates, and inflation has come down. That's a negative relationship, Madam Speaker. The Canada carbon rebate is sending more money back to 8 out of 10 Canadian families. We're addressing climate change and the affordability crisis. The Honourable Official Opposition Whip. Madam Speaker, what is shameful is that last year alone, this government paid consultants $21 billion, and now the RCMP is investigating them all again. Conservatives voted non-confidence and called for a carbon tax election so that British Columbians could axe the tax. The NDP leader and his member from South Okanagan, West Kootenay, voted to hike the carbon tax and keep this Prime Minister. Over 200,000 people in BC are using the food bank every month. Families are struggling and the NDP leader and his 12 BC members are all hell-bent on hiking the tax. If he's so confident... The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary... interesting that while the Conservatives pretend to care about Canadians, we are actually working to implement legislation and procedures to bring down prices like food, grocery prices, internet fees, and Madam Speaker, all while we're working hard for Canadians, you know what conservative, conservative lobbyists are doing? They're creating fake, secret lobbying companies to lobby the government while hiding from Canadians that it's the same chief advisors. And what did they lobby for, Madam Speaker? Higher internet costs. The Conservatives should come clean about who they're standing up to. The Honourable Deputy Opposition House Leader. Madam Speaker, Quebecers are disappointed today, disappointed there's no election to change this government because the bloc voted to save this Prime Minister's career. The bloc is bowing down to a Prime Minister who has invaded every area of Quebec jurisdiction, who's doubled the national debt, who has forced 800,000 Quebecers to line up for food banks every month. A vote for the bloc will cost you. What did the Prime Minister promise the bloc in order to save the Liberal government? The Honourable Minister of Public Services and Procurement. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Yes, indeed, Canadians and Quebecers are struggling to pay the bills. 
But what we see is that the Conservative government is against the Canada Child Benefit that has reduced child poverty by 40 percent in my colleagues' riding. They're against dental care, which is helping around 7,000 seniors in my colleagues' riding. So it's surprising that the Conservatives are so hypocritical. They're voting against things like the Canada Child Benefit and dental care. The Honourable Deputy Opposition House Leader. Thank you, Madam Speaker. What's hypocritical on the Liberal side is to talk about big programs and ignore what's happening at food banks and in Quebec families who can't afford their groceries every week because they don't have enough money, because the Liberal inflationary spending has increased the prices of everything. That's Liberal hypocrisy for you, Madam Speaker. And we wonder why the Bloc has decided to save this Liberal government instead of voting for our motion to hold an election over the carbon tax. What is the deal between the Bloc and the Liberals? The Honourable Minister, as I said before, there are thousands of families in my colleagues' riding who've received the Canada Child Benefit. It's about $500, $500 a month on average, and that has reduced poverty in parents and for, among parents and kids in every riding. And yet the, the Conservatives voted against the Canada Child Benefit. The Honourable Member for Laurence de la Belle. The federal government keeps on saying no to Quebec. This week there were this week there was uh, there were signs of a slight openness to cooperation on immigration, but that only lasted 4 days. The minister just shut the door on cooperation in an interview with Le Devoir. No to the French language requirement for temporary workers, no to letting Quebec choose workers admitted through the international mobility program, and no to rapid progress on asylum seekers. Why can't this minister put aside his contempt for more than four days? The Honourable, the Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Please. Madam Speaker, <laughs> post-pandemic, we had increased our immigration levels and businesses wouldn't have workers they need, and our economy is doing well. We, we recognize and need the balance to immigration levels with pressure from housing and infrastructure, which has led to stabilize our immigration levels for in uh, 2026. We will continue to work with provinces and territories to plan for sustainable and strategic immigration while building homes that we need. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Laurence de la Belle. It's incredible. At, that, at this point, it's obviously an obsession. No to responsible immigration management. No to the right to opt out of new interference in health care. No to advance requests for MAID. No to the right to protect official secularism. And all these no's in just five short weeks in Parliament. The Liberals, supported by the NDP and the silence of the Conservatives, are attacking Quebec's ability to make its own choices. Do they realize how wrong they are if they think Quebecers will put up with this? The Honorable Parliamentary Secretary. Madam Speaker, it's always interesting, and with all due respect to my colleague from the Bloc, what they want is to squabble. Canada does not, and the government of Canada, we, we work closely with the Quebec government on health, on immigration, and even, Madam Speaker, when it comes to child care. We looked at what Quebec was doing and, and extended it countrywide. We respect Quebec for its commitment. We will always work with Quebec, Madam Speaker. Mr. Burnaby. Corporate greed is rampant at Bell, at Bell Canada, and the Liberals are pouring money at Bell with no strings attached. Despite massive profits of over $2 billion, Bell keeps slashing jobs in journalism, hurting democracy, and abandoning workers. Bell CEO slashed 6,000 jobs in the last eight months and won't even show up to committee to be held accountable to Canadians who subsidize his profits. So when will the Liberals finally stand up for Canadians, rein in corporate greed, and protect journalism jobs in Canada? Yeah. Yeah. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Innovation, Science and Industry. Madam Speaker, thank you for the question from the
from the Honourable Member. First off, I want to say our thoughts are with all the employees and their families who are affected by this difficult news. It's a competitive industry landscape and companies must continually invest and adapt. That being said, let's not forget this company has made over $2 billion in profits and is now cutting thousands of jobs. Clearly, some choices have been made and our government will stand up to protect workers' rights and we've shown that through various uh, pieces of legislation in this House and we'll always do that. Madam Speaker. Here, here. I remember Couch and Malahat Langford. Madam Speaker, as Canadians observe Ramadan and Easter this month, many are scrambling to put food on the table. Organizations like Feed Ottawa are working hard to make sure no one is left behind, but it shouldn't be up to them alone. The Conservatives refused to help when they voted against a school food program to feed kids, and the Liberals Shame. are way too busy protecting the profits of grocer CEOs. The NDP has been pushing for a national school food program to ensure no child goes hungry. Will the Liberals include it in the upcoming budget? Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Housing, Infrastructure and Communities. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The idea is not without merit, and I thank the Honourable Colleague for raising it here today. What we do focus on, I'm not going to talk about what could or what may or may not be in the budget, but what we do focus on is the well-being of Canadian families. What have we seen in recent years? A massive decline in poverty throughout the country, and in particular, child poverty. When Canadians needed their government there during the pandemic, we were there for them, providing all sorts of relief through emergency programs. Where were the Conservatives? On the side of austerity, Madam Speaker. That party was not there for Canadians. They continue to be against Canadians in that vein. We will continue to be there for the country. Member for Calgary Forest Lawn. After eight years of this Liberal NDP Prime Minister and his carbon tax scam, Calgary Food Bank usage skyrocketed 50%. Albertans pay $2,900 into this scam and only get $2,000 back. There's a really bad Liberal math joke in there that just doesn't add up. And yesterday, this costly coalition voted to hike the carbon tax 23% on April the 1st. Why is their obsession with the carbon tax more important than the 70% of Canadians who are telling them to spike the hike so they can feed their families? Mr. Speaker, the fact of the matter is, is that Albertans have $700 more in their pockets every year because of the Canada carbon rebate. $700, Madam Speaker. And, Madam Speaker, what is important to note is that forest fires, floods, smoke... I'll get the Honourable uh, Minister to restart his question, just like I did a while ago with someone else who, uh, on that side. I want to remind members uh, to please hold off on anything that they have to say unless they're being recognized. The Honourable Minister. Madam Speaker, the truth of the matter is that Albertans get $700 a year more through the Canada Carbon Rebate. It's one of the highest amounts that anybody in the country gets back. Madam Speaker, Albertans want us to fight climate change. It's exactly what we're doing. We had forest fires, we've had floods, we've had wildfires. Madam Speaker, our residents of Alberta want us to fight climate change. What they don't want is the Conservatives to ruin the rebate. For Calgary Forest Lawn. That minister from Alberta should be ashamed of himself. He's constantly here, here. ramming this Prime Minister's woke ideology down the throats of Albertans when he should be the voice of Alberta at the cabinet table. Why doesn't he stand with the majority of Albertans that say axe attacks and scrap this scam instead of standing with this corrupt Prime Minister? Just a simple question for him. Does he have his job references lined up? Because after the next election, him and this carbon tax scam will be gone. Speaker, I'm glad to see that we've reached such a level of collegiality in this House that somehow the Conservatives think they can threaten my job with what residents in Alberta want, which is us for to fight climate change. Madam Speaker, where was that person when there were floods in Calgary, when there were forest fires burning Fort McMurray? These people think it's a joke. It's not woke. They need to wake up. Climate change is real. $700 more in the pockets of Albertans. That is real change. That's the Canada carbon rebate. Speaker, yesterday the NDP Liberal government voted to increase the carbon tax by 23 per cent, making the cost of gas, groceries and home heating more expensive. In my community in January alone, the Berry Food Bank saw over 7,000 individuals in need of food assistance and they provided 540 emergency food hampers for individuals experiencing homelessness. This year, a million more Canadians than last year we forced to go to food banks, but the Prime Minister plans to quadruple his costly carbon tax anyway. 
Why is he ignoring 70% of Canadians and the seven premiers who want to axe the tax? Good, good question. Comment your Secretary of the Minister of Environment and Climate Change. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The affordability crisis that Canadians are feeling is real, and we need to have real solutions for it, like the Canada Carbon Rebate, which sends more money back to 8 out of 10 Canadian families. But for the Conservatives to use the words of food banks and food rescue organizations, food security organizations and poverty experts, uh, continually in this House, none of those experts, none of those economists or those charities suggest that ditching our environmental plan and axing the tax would help Canadians. Absolutely none of those organizations say that, Madam Speaker. So if the Conservatives want to continue to use the words of the food banks, they ought to read the reports. The Honourable Mayor for Barry Springwater, Oro Medonte. Thank you, Speaker. I have the numbers right here from the province of Ontario, where the member opposite and I both live. In the province of Ontario, the average family pays $1,674 and receives a rebate of $1,047. That leaves them $627 they're paying extra. Those facts just aren't accurate. After eight years, farmers in my community are struggling and they know that the Prime Minister and his carbon tax coalition are not worth the cost. A poultry farmer in my riding's gas bill is almost $10,000 a month, with a third of that being the carbon tax. This will only get worse when the Prime Minister increases his carbon tax by 23% on April 1st. If the Prime Minister refuses to axe the tax, why won't he let Canadians... No Parliamentary Secretary. Speaker, what the parliamentary budget officer said is that he's distressed with the selective use of facts from these reports. What he said very clearly yesterday was that the consensus of economists is that carbon taxes are the least interruptive way to reduce emissions. He added, it is true that the carbon tax is often seen by many economists as the least disruptive and probably the most cost-effective way of reaching certain levels of carbon emissions. The PBO report deserves better than these Conservatives using selective numbers to try to peddle their climate change denial narrative. The Honourable Member Yorkton Melville. Thank you, Speaker. This NDP Liberal government voted to increase the carbon tax by 23 per cent, making the cost of groceries, gas, and home heating even more expensive. This Prime Minister is not worth the cost as he will raise the carbon tax to $2,618 in Saskatchewan. Why are they ignoring 70 per cent of Canadians and seven of our best premiers who want to axe the tax? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Madam Speaker, once again, Conservatives stand in this place and talk about affordability measures. Meanwhile, their own chief lobbyist for the leader of the official opposition is also lobbying on behalf of big grocers to not sign our code of conduct, Madam Speaker. We are working every day to bring in affordability measures to Canadians. While Conservatives talk a good talk, behind the scenes, they're there to help their wealthy, connected, insider friends. The, the Honourable Member Yorkton Melville. Madam Speaker, last year alone the Prime Minister paid consultants $21 billion and now the RCMP has multiple investigations into these Liberal contracts. On the carbon tax, I would love nothing more than to watch this member face to face with the good people of Yorkton Malville and try to explain to them why they are paying $525 more in carbon taxes after the rebate this year. Why do they continue to ignore 70 per cent of Canadians? Great question. It brought up the use of consultants because what happened the day after the like eighth leader of the Conservative Party, the current leader of the official opposition, came into power? The very next day, their chief strategist created a secret lobbying company. That lobbying company then produced. They're yelling, "It's so secret! We found out about it, Madam Speaker." Not part of the plan, certainly. Again, I'll get the honourable member to restart. I would ask members to please hold off on any comments or questions they have until they are being recognized. Order. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Madam Speaker, I'll repeat, they, the Conservatives heckle out so secret we found out about it. Yeah, not to their surprise, Canadians now know exactly what they're doing behind the scenes. They say one thing to Canadians, which is that they're going to stand up for them. But Madam Speaker, what they actually do is they set up secret companies to lobby for higher prices against Canadians' interests. Madam Speaker, you can't trust Conservatives because they're not in it for Canadians. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
the Honourable Member for Pierre Boucher, Les Patriotes Verchères. Madam Speaker, not only are the feds meddling in Quebec's affairs, they now seem to want to meddle in municipal affairs. They just can't help themselves. Our cities are concerned that the gas tax program, which expired in December, will be renewed but with new strings attached. But it's simple. All they're asking for is that the program be renewed as is. Municipalities know what their residents need, and the program works. So is the government going to renew the Canada Community Building Fund without any additional conditions? The Honourable Minister. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Our government has been crystal clear on this issue, and our record is also very clear. It speaks for itself. The relations between the federal government and municipalities is very strong. We will continue to engage with municipalities on infrastructure matters and related matters. I'm happy to discuss with that member further uh, the specifics of his concern, but we see throughout the country that infrastructure support on a range of matters has been supported in record ways by this government, and that will continue. for Pierre Boucher, Les Patriotes Verchères. If the federal government wants to prioritize housing, that's fine. Invest in housing programs. But they shouldn't put the money from the gas tax program that goes to the municip municipalities. That shouldn't be diverted into housing. This program is the program that works best for municipalities. But it, it, taking the money from one and giving to the other would be like robbing Peter to pay Paul. Uh, this is not the time for the federal government to wade in with this bad idea of imposing new conditions on, with the gas tax program. The Honourable Minister. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And I'm very happy to hear talk of cooperation and housing. That's uh, spe spe precisely what we're doing with a $1.8 billion deal to support housing projects in Quebec. In fact, Madam Speaker, it's the largest lump sum investment in housing in all of Quebec's history. And that's why I'm so proud of the result. We know there's still more and work to be done and more successes to be had in the months to come. The NDP Liberal government is about to raise the carbon tax by 23 percent on grass, gas, groceries and home heating, proving that after eight years this prime minister is not worth the cost. Per capita GDP is falling and prices are rising. That means Canadians are getting poorer while life gets more expensive. Only Conservatives have the courage to face Canadians in a carbon tax election, but if they won't call an election, will they at least listen to seven premiers and 70 per cent of Canadians and axe the tax? Mr. Secretary, the Minister of Environment and Climate Change. Thank you, Madam Speaker. It's clear now why the Conservatives and Premier Daniel Smith are on this bumper sticker campaign. It's because Premier Daniel Smith is increasing the price of gas in Alberta by their full 13 cents on April 1st through their provincial tax. They just want to scapegoat the price on pollution for their own decisions. Madam Speaker, in this case, I actually agree with Chris Sims, the Alberta director of the Canadian Taxpayers Federation, who said it's easy to throw your shoes at the federal government while cranking up your own fuel tax on the same day. Not good, Mr. S Madam Speaker. Not good. Conservative Speaker, Liberals are engaging in an orchestrated disinformation campaign to defend their destructive carbon tax. The report of the Independent Parliamentary Budget Officer says plainly on page 4, quote, taking into consideration both the fiscal and economic impacts, we estimate that most households will see a net loss, unquote. In response, Liberals have deliberately excluded the PBO's economic impacts to artificially inflate their numbers. Okay. When will this Prime Minister end this blatant deception and finally axe the tax? Here, here. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. It's incredible, Madam Speaker, that member from Edmonton is just here to do Premier Daniel Smith's work so that she can cover up her 13 cent a litre gas price hike on April 1st, Madam Speaker. It's absolutely atrocious that these Conservatives will stand in this House and allow Premier Daniel Smith under the guise of, of axe the tax bumper sticker campaigns to peddle the narrative that gas is expensive because of price on pollution. You know what that 13, price, 13 cent price hike on April 1st doesn't include? A rebate. The Canada Carbon yeah. Rebate rebates yeah. every single dollar of the Canada price on pollution back to consumers. That 13 cent hike does not. Honourable Member for Edmonton, Wataskawin. And I want to remind members
members to please keep the tone down. Madam Speaker, you'll notice that that member did not even try to answer my question. On page 3, the independent PBO states, quote, we incorporate estimates of the economic impact from the federal fuel charge into our calculation of net cost to provide a more complete picture of the overall impact on households. Taking into account that economic impact, the carbon tax clearly makes families in every province worse off. In Alberta next year, the report says that families will pay almost $1,000 more than they get back in rebates at a time when it costs more than ever for even the basics of life. How can any Alberta Liberal or NDP MP support this 23% tax increase? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Madam Speaker, what the PBO and the Auditor General said very clearly is that they're distressed with the selective use of facts from that report, Madam Speaker. And what they also said is that the economic cost is important to look at because there is a price to climate change. Climate change cost the Canadian economy over $2 billion last year, and it's likely that it's going to cost more this year because of wildfires adjacent to that member's riding. Madam Speaker, it's atrocious that the Conservatives stand in this House and misuse the Parliamentary Budget Officer's report. What he said very clearly is the consensus of economists is that carbon taxes are the least interruptive way to reduce emissions and that rebate sends eight out of ten families more money. The Honourable Member for Bose. Madam Speaker, today is the last day for the Prime Minister to backtrack on his April Fool's joke, the carbon tax hike. Canadians are struggling, but the bloc wants to radically increase the carbon tax, which will drive gas prices up by 20 cents a litre and have a huge impact on food prices. The bloc is propping the Prime Minister up after he broke our immigration system, raised taxes, and doubled the national debt. What did the Prime Minister offer the bloc in order to keep his government in power? The Honourable Minister. Madam Speaker, the price on carbon puts more money in the pockets of 8 out of 10 families. And that's because the revenues from the carbon tax are returned to Canadians. And that's why middle and lower class families are getting more money in their pockets than the carbon price is taking out of them. What the Conservatives want to do is reward the big polluters and to at the at the expense of the middle class and those working hard to join it. People are worried. They will bear the brunt of the climate crisis. They want no they deserve more of a say when it comes to tackling the climate emergency. A youth climate corps would do just that, all while creating good paying jobs. The Conservatives, well they have no climate plan, no plan to protect young people's future. The United States are already doing this, but because the Liberals are dragging their feet, Canada is being left behind. Will the Liberal government stop letting young people down and create a youth climate corps? General Parliamentary Secretary. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker, and I was proud to join uh, the call with, with my colleague from Victoria, as well as the leader of the Green Party, to meet with youth across the country who are interested in fighting climate change, Madam Speaker. Notably, no Conservative joined that call with these youth. But it is important to recognize, Madam Speaker, that kids across this country are concerned about the impact that we're having on our natural environment, so we're employing more of them through the Canada Parks and Recreation Association's Green Jobs Program, through Canada Summer Jobs, and through uh, the, the Minister of the Environment and Climate Change is Youth Advisory Committee. Madam Speaker, we've got to do more to listen to youth. We've got two weeks back home, and I hope everybody will do a school visit. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The our member for Timmins, James Bay. Joe Biden has created a clean energy economy with 100,000 new jobs while this Liberal government continues to stumble. We're just days away from the shutdown of the Mineral Exploration Tax Credit Program. You can't build a 21st century economy without metals, and those metals have to be found. So is this government going to outsource metal production to China? or the horrific human rights abuses in Congo, or will they support exploration in Canada where we consist on good wages, indigenous consent, and strong environmental standards? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of National Resources. The Honourable for uh, raising the question, our government and the Canadian population, we've created 40,000 new jobs in February. As the member mentioned, the mineral exploration tax credit is important to support exploration 
companies, junior companies. We, as a government, for the first time in 2017, extended the mineral tax exploration credit for five years to provide certainty to the industry. We are working with the industry right now. Uh, we're not going to, you know, looking at the budget coming so shortly, but we're going to make sure that we support our critical minerals, we support the mining industry, and we support mineral exploration in this country. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Member for Windenburg South Centre. Madam Speaker, Africa is home to five of the top ten fastest growing economies in the world. I'm proud of our government's investments to help businesses in my riding and across Canada reach new markets, including Africa. Earlier this year, the Canada-Africa Chamber of Business hosted the second Canada-Africa Business Conference in Kenya. Can the Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of International Trade update this House on his recent attendance at the conference, the opportunities for the Canadian and African businesses to grow, and what that means for businesses in my riding of Winnipeg South Centre? Thank you, Madam Speaker. Parliamentary Secretary. Madam Speaker, the Canada-Africa Business Conference reaffirmed the incredible value of export diversification and growing trade across Africa for Canadian businesses. It was a great success, which I know will help in collaboration and growing our industries. While in Nairobi, I got to see firsthand why Canada is recognized among the leading aerospace industries in the world. Let's continue to build on this momentum and enhance our trade ties with Africa. As we know, this creates good-paying jobs right here and across the continent of Africa. Thank you to the member for Winnipeg South Centre for his leadership in helping to grow trade and our economy. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Member for Caribou, Prince George. Madam Speaker, yesterday the Bloc and NDP shamefully voted to save the Prime Minister for a carbon tax election. Instead, they voted in favour of a 23% tax hike on Canadians just 10 days from now. That's no April Fool's. And let's be clear, that vote wasn't about saving the environment, it was about saving their pension. Yeah. After eight years of this Liberal NDP government, Canadians are struggling more than ever. More Canadians have food banks, more mental health crisis. Will the Prime Minister stop ignoring 70% of Canadians and 7 out of 10 Premiers and axe his tax? That's right. The Honourable Prime Minister, Secretary to the Minister of Innovation, Science and Industry. Well, Madam Speaker, I wish we could put a price on the methane coming out of the Conservative Party these days. Let's talk about hypocrisy. While our government is working hard to implement real solutions on the affordability challenges conservatives oppose and obstruct every step of the way the leader of the opposition we find out is being advised by Jenny Byrne who also lobbies for Loblaws and the day after he won his leadership campaign with her help uh, she set up a shell company to start lobbying uh, for him and what we learn now is that Jenny Burns, senior VP... The Honourable Member for Edmonton Manning. Thank you, Madam Speaker. On the second anniversary of this NDP liberal love affair, this nonsense government chooses to vote 23% hike on carbon tax, making the cost of gas, groceries and home heating even more expensive. This will cost the average Albertans an extra $911 per year. This Prime Minister is not worth the cost. Why is he still ignoring the 70% of Canadians and the seven Premiers who want to spike the hike and axe the tax? The Honourable Prime Minister Secretary. So not only is Jenny Byrne lobbying for Loblaws and advising the Leader of the Opposition, she attends Conservative Party caucus meetings every week, and she sh set up a shell company to lobby, and her senior VP is lobbying uh, the very office that she advises. Now, if that's not double dipping, I'm not sure what is. I don't think, and I think all Canadians de deserve some answers here, but let's stop the pretending. Whose corner are the Conservatives actually in? Good question. The Honourable Member for Cirrus Moose Mountain. Well, maybe someone will try and answer a question for a change. Madam Speaker, seating is fast approaching. Farmers are busy preparing equipment, cedars and trucks, purchasing fuel, fertilizer, seed, arranging families, workers and their financing, and their situation has never been more desperate. The carbon tax has escalated their fears, and now with a 23% increase as of April 1st, it has only made them, their stress work greater. With his inflationary spending, this Prime Minister and his NDP Liberal government is not worth the cost. Will this government spike the hike and axe the tax? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Ag Agriculture. The, uh, and I want to thank the Honourable Member for the question. The only party stalling 234 is their party. They keep putting up speakers. But speaking of farmers, farmers need to rely on business risk management programs. We're the only party who've increased business risk management programs and their budgets by 25%, while the other side cut their budgets. 
The Honourable for Peace River Westlaw. Speaker, after eight years, we know that this Liberal NDP government is just not worth the cost. And now on April 1st, the carbon tax is going up by 23 percent. We know that the Liberal NDP carbon tax scam only makes Canadians poor. Yeah. We also know that if you tax the farmer who grows the food and tax the truck driver who brings the food to the store and you tax the store that sells the food, Canadians can't afford food. When will the Liberal government see, see the facts and axe the tax? The Honourable Minister. When will this Member of Parliament and the climate dinosaurs on that side of the House wake up to the fact that the planet is burning. He is from northern Alberta. He knows what impact the forest fires in McMurray had. He knows the impact of floods in Calgary. Madam Speaker, Canada Carbon Rebate is responsible for reducing our emissions by 25 percent. Albertans in his area get more money than other Albertans because of the rural top up. What they are trying to peddle to Albertans is shameful. 13 percent gas tax hike from the Premier, and they're on us. What a shame. The Honourable Member for Terrebonne. We knew that the January deadline for penalty fee repayment of CBA loans threatened the survival of our small businesses. We did everything we could to warn the government, but now it's reaping what it sowed. The Office of the Sir Intendant of Bankruptcy reveals that in January, the number of insolvency rose by 129 per cent. January 2024 was the worst month in the office's 40-year history. We're in the middle of a wave of bankruptcies due to this visionless government. What is it going to do today to stop the bleeding? The, the Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The SEBA program supported over 900,000 small businesses through the pandemic, and we estimate 80 per cent of them have repaid their loans so far. As we move away from the pandemic, we are taking serious, concrete action to support small businesses, both by, by providing funding and by cutting costs, Madam Speaker. We recently finalized agreements to cut credit card fees by up to 27 percent, which will save small businesses across Canada a billion dollars, Madam Speaker. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Terrebonne. Let's talk figures. Already for last year, Equifax recorded a 44 percent increase in business bankruptcies. Based on January 2024 data, it'll be worse this year. No one in this House should find this situation acceptable. The government needs to be flexible with businesses. It must talk to them directly and study their files on a case-by-case -case basis. It can't continue to do nothing while businesses continue to close their doors. When will they finally open their eyes and take responsibility for preventing bankruptcies? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Speaker, and I thank the member opposite for the opportunity to, to speak on this issue. As we move forward uh, from the pandemic, small businesses have nearly three years until the end of 2026 to repay their SIBA loans, and they have access to as low as 5 percent interest rate. Meanwhile, we are investing in communities to strengthen our economy. Earlier this month, we announced $2.5 million in federal funding to enhance the Indigenous Women's Entrepreneur Program and create an Indigenous Youth Entrepreneurship Program. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Member for Montmagny, Lisley, Kamouraska, Rivière de Loup. Madam Speaker, in eight years, this Liberal government has succeeded in breaking our immigration system, destroying our economy and doubling our national debt. Uh, food has gotten very expensive. But what's even more expensive is voting block. Taxes are, are being taxed. Block, the block can cut talk, tax, but it doesn't want to. What did this prime minister promise the block to get their unconditional support? The Honourable Minister. Madam Speaker, once again, we've heard the Conservative Party is the party of hope and inaction in this chamber. And they're talking about working with Quebecers, and we are talking about working with Quebecers and Canadians to make life more accessible, to increase jobs, to support unions. Madam Speaker, we're here to take action and to help Quebecers and Canadians, but they are only going to look for quarrels. The Honourable Member for Montmagny. People are desperate, Madam Speaker. After eight years of this Liberal government, the bloc is still doing everything it can to keep the PM in power. The same Prime Minister who has destroyed our economy, that people across the country are now unable, unable to meet their basic needs. 
why are Canadians are having a hard time feeding themselves. They keep raising taxes. Can the Prime Minister tell us the terms of his contract with the Bloc to save his career? The Honourable Minister. Madam Speaker, the first thing we did when we came to power was to reduce taxes on the middle class. The first thing that the Conservatives did was to vote against that. We also set up the CCB, and they voted against that. Now, if my honourable colleague would like to know more about his riding, I would ask him to visit over 3,000 housing projects in Montmagny, Villarosevin, amongst others. They were created in his riding. There have been some dozen uh, low-rent projects, and even though they only created six. The Honourable Member for St. Albert Edmonton. Madam Speaker, the Prime Minister was ordered by Parliament to turn over the arrived scam receipts and to come up with a plan to get taxpayers their money back. What the Prime Minister tabled this week is nothing more than a whitewash. We still don't have receipts, and they don't have a plan to get taxpayers their money back. So just a number. How much money did these Liberals award fraudsters and scammers and when will taxpayers get a refund? Parliamentary Secretary. Madam Speaker, as I've said before in this place, we take these allegations extremely seriously. We expect all contractors in the procurement process and all rules to be followed. Anyone who doesn't follow those rules will come with consequences. CBSA has already put in place several new measures to improve the procurement process. There have been announcements made as well with the Minister of Procurement to ensure that the procurement process throughout government is transparent, accountable, and that questionable issues like this don't happen again. The Honourable Deputy de Sudbury. The Honourable Member for Sudbury. Speaker, in a world where global cooperation and support for the most vulnerable are more critical than ever, the Leader of the Opposition has proposed cuts to what he calls wasteful foreign aid. Can the Minister clarify the impact of these cuts on Canada's security as well as on our standing as a moral leader globally. The Honourable Minister. Madam Speaker, the Leader of the Official Opposition's proposed cuts uh, threaten to undermine our global uh, role in peace and security and stability, as well as undermine the peace and safety and security of Canadians. Uh, cutting programs like demining and, and helping conflict-affected children risks our global reputation. And uh, these proposed cuts would signal a retreat from global leadership at a time when global challenges actually demand that we do more and that we collaborate with other nations. And so, and if he's willing to make these dangerous cuts that threaten the peace and security of Canadians, what else is he going to cut? He's simply not worth the risk. No, not at all. The honourable, uh, the honourable um, uh, official opposition deputy. Uh, I'll, I'll take leader? it, Madam Speaker. <laughs> Five years. When is this government going to list the IRGC as the terrorists that they are? Yeah, yeah. The Honourable uh, Parliamentary Secretary. Madam Speaker, we obviously recognize and condemn the Iranian government as a state sponsor of terrorism. We have implemented several measures to ban um, some members of the IRGC or the members of the IRGC to enter Canada. We have put in place sanctions. Madam Speaker, we will take the advice from our national security advisors and officials who make these recommendations, but Madam Speaker, we will do everything to keep Canadians safe. Yeah. Official opposition deputy leader. So they said last year they were working on it. Yesterday, the minister changed the story, saying that his agencies didn't even give him that advice. Today, I don't understand that answer, and neither will Canadians. So which answer is it? Which story? We've got a minister over there who won't condemn the most vile anti-Semitism, another minister who held hands with a literal terrorist. Is there no courage at all again? I'm going to ask one more time. What day will you list the IRGC as the terrorists that they are in this country? Yeah. 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 Ye
she needs to address all questions and comments through the chair and not directly to the members. The Honourable uh, Parliamentary Secretary. Thank you, Madam Speaker. As I said before, that we do condemn and acknowledge that the Iranian government is a state sponsor of terrorism, that we have put in place sanctions, robust sanctions. We've used the immigration legislation to ban people from visiting Canada. Madam Speaker, we will continue to listen to the advice of security services, but make no mistake, we recognize the RG IRGC as a state sponsor of terrorism, and we will do everything to keep Canadians safe. The Honourable Member for Calgary Heritage. While the clerical regime brutalizes women in Iran, they export terror abroad. Russia and Ukraine. Houthis in Yemen, Hamas, Hezbollah, Iraqi militia. This week, victims of Hamas atrocities shared their stories. Like the PS752 victims, they are calling on the government to list the IRGC as a terror organization. It's been five years. What day? When will these NDP Liberals stand up for victims and list the IRGC? said we are listening to Canadians and we take this matter very seriously. This is precisely why, as I've said in my earlier answers, we have put in place robust sanctions against the IRGC. We recognize Iran as a state sponsor of terrorism. We are using the immigration legislation to ensure that there is a ban from entering Canada. Madam Speaker, we will continue to listen to the advice of security services because we will do everything in our power to keep Canadians safe. The Honourable Member for Fleetwood Port Cales. Thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. Canadians expect their governments to take action on climate change and address affordability issues. Putting a price on carbon while sending rebates to Canadians is the most cost effective way to fight climate change. Affordability is front and centre in this system, which puts more money into the bank accounts of Canadian families. Can the, prime, uh, the Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Environment and Climate Change share with this House how the Canada Carbon Rebate helps Canadians? Parliamentary Secretary. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Canada Carbon Rebate is made possible because we put a price on pollution to lower our emissions and fight climate change. But affordability is front and centre in this system, which literally puts more money back into the pockets of eight out of ten Canadian families. Madam Speaker, Conservatives offer no solutions and continue to spread misinformation about climate change to Canadians. They want to cut the Canada Carbon Rebate payments that are helping Canadians during these challenging times, and instead they want to help their friends in big industry continue to pollute freely. Madam Speaker, it's clear that the Conservatives don't care about fighting climate change. They want to raise our emissions in Canada, and they do not care about our children's future. Madam Speaker, it's a shame. The Honourable Member for Skeena Balti Valley. Madam Speaker, yesterday I asked the Environment Minister if he would commit to doing what it takes to ensure that weather stations on the BC coast remain up and running this coming winter. These stations, like the Holland Rock Weather Station near Prince Rupert, provide critical, life-saving information for mariners, and the Holland Rock Station hasn't been working since early January. In his response, the Minister said he'll do what he can, but that he's not the Finance Minister. So, to the Finance Minister, will she ensure that Environment can Canada has the resources they need to keep these critical, life-saving weather stations up and running all winter. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary, the Minister of Environment and Climate Change. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. I am poor, I, I, uh, I'm glad that my colleague opposite is raising this important issue. It offers me an opportunity to highlight uh, the announcement that we made last week for 32 new state-of-the-art radar stations right across this country. That will add to the safety of Canadians. It will provide more reliable weather information in advance of extreme weather. And in the face of climate change, Madam Speaker, unfortunately, these events are likely to happen more and more. I appreciate the highlight from the uh, Honourable Member from the NDP, and I'll work together with, uh, with his office to ensure that that weather station is up and running in due course. Thank you, Madam Jordan, Speaker. Don't cut it. I remember for Spadina, Fort York. Madam Speaker, a farmer care deal by the governing coalition makes Canadians again wait for, for the smoke and mirrors to clear. They've seen a dented dental deal that leaves out the middle class and makes seniors wait to age 87. They've seen numerous carbon tax grabs rake in billions but do little for the environment. And they've seen a child care strategy eliminate 100,000 spaces. Finally, they've seen a cannabis policy that's actually grown a huge black market. Madam Speaker, Canadians aren't fooled by the half schemes of the Liberal government and their NDP buttress. The Emperor has no clothes. Madam Speaker, Speaker, when will he take his walk on the beach? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Uh, Madam, 
Madam Speaker, thank you very much. I remember not too long ago that member was begging to be a member of the Liberal caucus. Didn't really work out for him. He's now auditioning to join the other side, and he can. He'll find a place over there where they want to cut child care, cut dental care, cut pharmacare. A few weeks ago, when this government tabled pharmacare legislation, the leader of the opposition ran away from reporters at a press conference when they asked him about pharmacare. That party does not care about the middle class. They don't care about the vulnerable. We're going to do all these things that Canadians require to ensure success. And that brings us to the end of question period. I do want to ask members, uh, just to wish members a, a great time in their riding and a, a good Easter weekend. Spend as much time with your family as you can because that is extremely important. We have uh, some points of orders. The Honourable Member South Shore, St. Margaret's. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. I'd like to raise an issue with regard to uh, some statements uh, before question period today that concerns not only all members of this House, but all uh, Canadians. And when I read uh, the famous Green Book on page 640, I see here that it says uh, the Premier of PEI notes that 23 per cent increase in the carbon tax is a punitive and unfair tax and calls for it to be removed. So first of all, the Honourable Member cannot use, uh, no matter what book he uses, whether it's a, whether it's a book uh, that we have here in the House of Commons or any other book, it's a prop. I would just say that that is actually a point of debate. Uh, the Deputy de Mégantic-Lérable. The Honourable Member for Mégantic-Lérable. Madam Speaker, during question period, the Minister of Public Services spoke of hypocrisy now, let me just say that there was police monitoring of the line waiting at a food bank in Montreal. I would like to ask for a unanimous consent to table a document that shows the hypocrisy of this Liberal government. I'm hearing no. To Sanders Gulf Islands. Madam Speaker, I'm rising at my first opportunity on a point of order related to decorum in this place. I specifically reference uh, Standing Order 10 and Standing Order 16, arising from the um, extreme levels of noise, uh, chanting, banging, and other things that disrupted decorum during last night's votes. The first vote was on, a ma was on an opposition day motion, and then there were numerous votes related to matters of supply put forward by the President of Treasury Board. It was impossible to hear the names of the members as they stood to vote. It created confusion. It was, ex and I, I re reference particularly, I'm in trying to find the exact rule that deals with how we should conduct ourselves while votes are taking place. I do think Standing Order 16 is the most relevant, that when the Speaker is putting a question, no member shall enter, walk or out or across the House or make any noise or disturbance. I hope the Speaker can provide guidance so that members will know how to conduct themselves when votes are taking place. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I appreciate your Honourable Member bringing that forward. I'm sure that you will remember that I also did uh, raise this yesterday uh, because it was very difficult for the cable officers to hear uh, what was going on and to hear each other um, do... Uh, uh, um, Called out the called the members uh, for the votes, and so I do want to remind members to please, please be respectful and to please keep the noise level down, uh, especially when we're having votes. But not but not just especially, but uh, at all times it would be best. Uh, we have a point of order from the on this point of order, the honourable uh, government uh, whip uh, official opposition whip. Okay. I'm not. I'm not sure I want that job, Madam Speaker, but when we're government, we'll see. Um, on this point of order, Madam Speaker, we applied most of the votes last night. And the fact that there was some noise in the chamber, the Speaker brought the, all proceedings into line. This is the Speaker's job. It is not the job of individual deputies or members to stand up and chastise everyone in this House. Our Speakers are in control of the proceedings, and we accept I, I, I would say that, you know, when members raise a point of order about the quorum in the House, it's not chastising members, but I do want to remind members, again, that it is up to every 
um, every parliamentarian in this House to ensure that they respect the rules of order in the House to, to ensure that the House can flow properly. Uh, the Honourable Member, the, another point of order, the Honourable Member uh, Cumberland Colchester. Okay, you two sit. What the Premier of done? Nova Scotia called this carbon tax hike. I would like to table documents and need to seek unanimous consent to table this document, which the Premier is clear. I'm afraid I'm, I, there's been many indications that the Honourable Member doesn't have unanimous consent to present that. The Honourable Deputy of Bellechasse, Les Echemins, Les Vies, se lève sur un. The Honourable Member for Bellechasse, Les Echemins, Les Vies, on a point of order. Mr. Speaker, during question period, the Minister of Procurement discussed housing. With unanimous consent, I would like to inform the House that there is a problem in Laval where rents are over $500 despite cockroach, mold, and mouse infestations. And yet people are seeing substantial increases in rent in this dilapidated housing. So with unanimous consent, I'd like to table this article. I was about to ask the House, but I hear a nay. The Honourable Member for Stormont Dundas, South Glengarry. Speaker, following question period today and some of the exchanges regarding the carbon tax and the news that Western University's food bank has seen a 600 per cent increase in its usage and a 40 per cent of all post secondary students. I've already uh, indicated that there will be no uh, unanimous consent on this point. Uh, before we continue with a number of points of orders which are being raised, I would like to ask members, uh, if at all possible, to making sure that we uh, use the time of the House very efficiently, that if members are seeking unanimous consent, that they do attempt uh, to negotiate that in advance uh, with the House leaderships from the different parties so that we can make sure that we use the time efficiently. The Honourable Member from uh, Barry Springwater, Oro Madate. Put out a statement said the people across Canada are hurting right now from the high cost of living. The federal government needs to put a stop to the carbon. Unfortunately, the uh, member does not have unanimous consent to present that document. And the House Honourable Member from Thornhill. During a uh, question period, the member from Pickering was talking about how great Canadians have it because of their government. But I just want a reminder that uh, 40 percent of, of, uh, of an increase in. So, so unfortunately, the Honourable Member, uh, who is a uh, is a, a very uh, incredibly a capable member understands <laughs> that that is a, a point of debate. Uh, the Honourable Member from uh, Calgary, uh, uh, Rocky Ridge. Well, thanks, Mr. Speaker. I'll be brief. Uh, up to 50 military families from CFB Gagetown are using the local food bank every month. Despite that, the carbon tax is... This is a, a similar point that was raised by the Honourable Member from, uh, from Thornhill, so I'm afraid we're entering into debate. The Honourable Member from Central Okanagan, Similkanin, Nicola. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And during debate today, there was multiple references to my great province of British Columbia. I would ask for unanimous consent to table this letter from the... I thank the Honourable Member for immediately getting to the question of asking for unanimous consent. Unfortunately, there is no unanimous consent for this. The Honourable Member from uh, New Brunswick Southwest. Thank you. The New Brunswick Premier has written the Prime Minister calling on him to cancel the carbon tax. I seek you see to table this letter. I also appreciate the Honourable Member asking and, and uh, at the front end of this question seeking unanimous consent, but unfortunately there is not unanimous consent for this. The Honourable Member from Mission Massey, uh, Fraser Canyon. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. On a more serious matter, the member from Cambridge, in responding to a question from the Bloc Québécois on the status of small businesses, failed to note that business insolvencies are up 41 percent. Therefore, I ask unanimous consent. So, uh, I, th I thank the honourable member uh, for seeking unanimous consent, but there is none to be offered. Again, I do hope that the honourable member has made some attempt uh, to seek unanimous consent. The honourable member from Calgary, Amidnapur. Yeah, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Um, I'll just wait for everyone on intelligent TL debate. Um, but previous to that, I would just like to point out, uh, you know, we heard definite concern from the member for Milton about Alberta. Uh, in addition to, um, I haven't even said anything. Yeah. I, I, I would. It's, it, 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 it's not. A, it's, it is. Initial. It's always in everybody's interest, and I say this to all members, and quite sincerely, 
Um, if you want to raise a point of order, I, I do recommend that you get straight to the point of to what point of order you want to bring up, because otherwise, uh, when we hear the uh, premise and the introduction, it's often getting into debate and, and forces the chair to, to say that that is a matter of debate, as opposed to either seeking unanimous consent or raising a point of order. So, the honourable member either raises a, a point of, uh, of order or seeks unanimous consent right away. The Honourable Member, member from Milford. Calgary, uh, mid uh, Mr. Chair, thank you very much. Where he mentioned um, Premier Smith, and I also have some comments regarding Premier Smith, that she is also encouraging this government to get rid of this 23 per cent carbon tax. So, so this, is, this is definitely a... So the Honourable Member, I'll invite the Honourable Member to please to sit down. I'll, ask, I'll invite the honourable member to please take her spot because this is clearly a point of clearly a point of debate. L'honorable député de Burnaby, New Westminster, Burnaby. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, just to remind uh, members of this house, it cost eighty thousand dollars to run this house for an hour. So the Conservatives' filibuster has cost twenty thousand dollars to Canadian. I, I do thank the honourable member. I do thank the honourable member from New Westminster Burnaby to, in reminding the House in terms of the, the all the expenses which are required when we don't take the opportunity to negotiate these things in advance. I do ask members to do this. I see that the member uh, from uh, Central. Uh, uh, Coast of Bay Central, uh, not Notre Dame, is rising on his feet. Uh, but I, I do hope that the member will either raise a point of order uh, that he wants to quote, or gets immediately to the request for a unanimous consent. The honourable member. Point of order, Mr. Speaker, and I think we'll have consent to, uh, for me to table this letter that was written by. So the I, 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 I regret. I regret, I regret to the honourable member from Central, from, I, the honourable, the honourable member is a is a reasonable man. I'll ask him, please, he knows that the speaker stands up, that the speaker should, sit, that the member should sit down. Um, the, the member from uh, Costa Bay Central Notre Dame does not have unanimous consent to present that point. The honourable member from Prince George Caribou. Caribou Prince George. Caribou Prince George. Far be it for me to uh, correct you. Mr. Speaker, on page 75 of the, the most current BC budget, it does say that our province of British Columbia is federally mandated to implement the carbon tax. Yes. Therefore, I would like to. So I, I, th I thank the honourable member for getting to the point of unanimous consent. It was clear that there is no unanimous consent for that order. Affaire courante ordinaire, dépôt Daily routine of business, tabling of documents. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to table in both official languages information we've received regarding the Public Service Commission of Canada's annual reports from 2020 to 2022 23. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Women and Gender Equality and Youth. I have the honour to table in both official languages the government's responses to 80 petitions. These returns will be tabled in an electronic format. Introduction of government bills. Statements by ministers. Reports from interparliamentary delegations. Presenting reports from committees. The Honourable, Honourable Member from Kingston and the Islands. No, I'm turning it. So she's online. Member from Halifax West. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I have the honor to present in both official languages the Standing Committee on Justice and Human Rights in relation to Bill C-332, an act to amend the criminal code controlling or coercive conduct. Le comité a été the committee has studied the bill and decided to report it back to the House with amendments. Thank you. The Honourable Member from New Brunswick Southwest. Mr. Speaker, I have the honour to present in both official languages the 37th report of the Standing Committee on Public Accounts in relation to the motion adopted on Wednesday, March 6, 2024, regarding Report 1, Arrive Can, of the 2024 reports of the Auditor General of Canada 
That motion reads that the committee shall report to the House that it calls on the government to prohibit any government employees from simultaneously working as an external contractor. Mr. Speaker, I also have the honour to present in both official languages the 38th report of the Standing Committee on Public Accounts in relation to the motion adopted on Wednesday, March 6, 2024, regarding Report 1, Arrive Can, of the 2024 reports of the Auditor General of Canada. And that motion reads that the Committee invites the President of the Treasury Board, Anita Anand, to appear for no less than two hours in relation to the Arrive Can study, and that this meeting occur within three weeks of this motion being adopted. Thank you. Introduction of private members' bills. Mr. Doherty, seconded by Mr. Majumdar, moves for leave to introduce a bill entitled An Act Respecting the Establishment and Award of a Special Service Medal for Domestic Emergency Relief Operations. This motion is deemed adopted. The Honourable Member from Caribou, Prince George. Mr. Speaker, I'm honoured to rise today and table my new private member's bill on Act Respecting an Establishment and Award of a Special Service Medal for Domestic and Emergency Relief Operations. Mr. Speaker, this bill would establish a service mem uh, medal for Canadian